So when I think of star fucking, I think about those memories and it, and it wasn't fun and the insecurity of those people who were often physically very beautiful. I mean, that's part of the reason they were chosen was because they were so pretty. And like any dum-dum, I was like, oh, I'm having sex with a really handsome man and a beautiful young woman. I suppose they'll know everything about sex. Well, no, they didn't. Yeah. And, and then they cried and cried and cried and were just like, seemed so loveless and alone. It was just a, a real, real heartbreaker of a situation. I don't think I really got to enjoy the whole notion of star fucking until many years later, my friends Shar Rednauer, and I remember Rachel Bussell was involved in this too, did a little zine called Star Fucker, where we all wrote fantasies about fucking absurdly famous people. <laughs> me and Monica Lewinsky, a lesbian tale, you know. <laughs> me and Motley Crue, the entire band, you know. And I remember feeling like I'm finally laughing and finding this stuff like a turn on and a hoot instead of just thinking about everybody who OD'd and died and is, a, you know, in a mental institution. When you ask about, about me, um, it's, um, for me to feel uninhibited in bed, I have to, I have to forget all that. I mean, I can fool around with it. You know, I, I, I certainly have had, there's something about when, like you're, if you're at a play party and you're in a position where you're the cute little dominatrix or whatever, it's easier to tease people and lord, lord over them and that, that's fine. That's easy enough to do. But to get into a, a submissive or vulnerable space, I, I can't be, you know, kind of putting my ass in the air and saying, by the way, if you read all 30 of my books. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, no. I mean, that just, am I naive? You should tell me. Please instruct me. No, I, I find it quite delightful. <laughs> um, so Full Exposure was, was the first book of yours that I, I read. Oh. Um, and so the idea of, and that was really where, like, for me as a budding sex geek, um, starting to look at how our own concepts of what is erotic is just not the kind of thing my mom and dad ever sat us down at the, mm. my brothers and I at the breakfast table. It's like, you know, Reed, this is how your father and I, you know, negotiate what's erotic for ourselves and <laughs> make things work. Um, and then this idea, and I, I think it was in um, Sexual State of the Union, where you talk about uh, lust brings out the lies in people or something like that. Um, so to the extent that, I mean, because, because I mean, obviously read the book, the memoir is really great. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and I don't want to talk so much about the book. I'm more curious about just other tangents sure. that we can go on. So for you, and, and how has your erotic life shifted over the years um, for yourself? Well, I'll tell you how I got the inspiration for Full Exposure. That wasn't my idea for the title because I know what inspired me was to ask the question, what's your sexual philosophy? And what's your erotic identity? And that came from two places the, to sort of conceptualize it and word it that way. One was um, really from the beginning when I had my first job at Good Vibrations and my boss, Joni Blank, said, well, you should have some training. You should go to San Francisco Sex Information and they train these volunteers to answer people's sex questions. And it's like boot camp for sex educators. And, um, and you go and you watch movies and you have these kind of rap groups. It was very like 70s, you know, bear your soul, you know, this, yeah, consciousness raising. And one thing that gets stressed right off the bat, it was to take your parochial ideas about intercourse and penis vagina penetration as the beginning and ending of things, or that there's a certain, that gay sex means one thing, or that any, that sex could be reduced to a position on a page in a book. You quickly learned that that was crap and that sex was really anything. You know, it was all in your head and it could be the, the slightest touch, the strangest, most esoteric experience. This is why so often you, you'll hear people say to you, my God, you know, I, I just got off the phone and 
I had the most powerful orgasm of my life. How could I have just had the best sex of my life and I've never even met this person, and it was all over a phone line? How could that happen? Well, it, even before there were telephones and computers, we still had those, you know, people would do that as pen pals. <laughs> people have always had ways of just, you know, going into sexual ecstasy without um, methodical Darwin-esque, you know, methods of touching. And as soon as someone introduces that idea to you, you go, of course, of course. You know, you have memories of when you were a kid and you rubbed yourself on a vibrating dryer or you were just <laughs> rolling in the grass and it felt so good. You could be like a little puppy. You just couldn't get over it. We all have deeply sensual memories. Um, it could be an aroma, a song that just gives you goosebumps were motivated to feel sexual because of that. And to finally meet some intellectuals and scholars in the field who put that into words for me, I was like, oh, this is gonna, it did help me be a better vibrator store and clerk because <laughs> I, I was so much, had so much more compassion and empathy for where someone might be coming from. And that, you know, I wasn't just gonna go up to them and say, so how many attachments do you want? You know, like I, I could have some, um, I don't think I was ever that stupid, but to have more charm and more um, consideration for how every different place someone could be coming from. And then secondly, this is one of what I call the silver lining of the AIDS pandemic is, okay, we have, first we have this no-name disease, then, we, then it's called AIDS, then we start discussing HIV and there began to be a whole realm of sex education and um, disease prevention that was organized around safer sex guidelines. And it's evolved a lot over the years. But um, it got developed a lot at universities where there was a great deal of concern that all these incoming freshmen were, you know, needed to be shepherded in just the right way. And kids would get asked, what are your limits? What are your boundaries? What is your sexual philosophy? They would use terms like that they were just talking about it in terms of barriers and boundaries to STDs. Mm -hmm. But for me, I was like, oh, it's so much bigger than that. I mean, you know, put aside the rubber and just think what that could really be. And um, I found that those conversations that were kind of set up in the public health world actually took on a, a more creative meaning for me. And that was around the time that I wrote Full Exposure. And I thought, I kind of want to get under people's skin. And instead of thinking, um, okay, you want to know how many people I've slept with? I mean, who cares? Because you've I've met virgins who were you know, technical virgins who were had incredible sexual wisdom and powers of penetration and insight. And then you've met people who seem to have fucked everyone and know nothing. I wouldn't say it's usually the other way around. I mean, I'm not going to be like a complete idiot about this. I do find that people who have sex for a living or who just manage to have a lot of sex in their lifetime generally do know a lot more about sex. And I've, you know, I, I feel kin to that. But when I, when I write a book that's for, you know, all of America, <laughs> great public, I... I don't, um, I don't want to throw that kind of gauntlet down. I want to say, just reach inside and, you know, you'll find so much sexual feeling and interest in your own, in your own history that there'll be plenty to work with. You know, you don't have to have dated so-and-so or have been to the right party or got, you know, a special invitation. Not, that's not required. I suppose I have a very democratic sense of it. And if I'm a little beleaguered and disappointed this, these days um, in my political viewpoint, it's because this country is going through a, a time where elitism is, is, is on a pedestal. And there's this sense that thing, that the notion of democracy and something that could be open for everyone, that everyone could participate in, is not popular. And so if I, if I um, say, 
yes, come in. Everybody come in. It's free. I, I want to talk. I, let me share everything I can share with you about what I know about sex. There's the sense of really? Oh, I don't know. I mean, if it doesn't cost a million dollars, really, is anyone interested? I mean, that, that kind yeah. of, um, um, it's the opposite of the 60s spirit that well, I came of age 